Nicole Hemmer is Assistant Professor in Presidential Studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center for Public Affairs. She also holds an appointment as a research associate in the United States Studies Center at the University of Sydney in Australia. Professor Hemmer is a contributing editor to the US News and World Report, a columnist for Vox, and a co-host of the Past Present Podcast. Her first book, Messengers of the Right, Conservative Media and the Transformation of American Politics, was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2016. Her presentation today is titled, From Fox News to Fake News, the Unmaking of American News Media. Please help me welcome Nicole. Thank you, and thank you to the Howenstein Center for convening this very fascinating and necessary conference at a time when it seems like just about everything militates against these kinds of conversations, um, that you put so much energy and so many resources into putting something like this together is really commendable. It's only been a few months since the phrase fake news entered the political lexicon, and already the sound of the phrase brings with it a sort of bone tiredness. The epithet was quickly cannibalized in an orgy of opportunism almost as soon as it was coined. It initially referred to a distinct phenomenon of stories made up out of whole cloth. And then it became a charge like bias, loosely applied to just about everything a person disagreed with. But today I'm going to argue that fake news, rather than just being a short-lived artifact of the 2016 election, is part of a century-long debate about journalism, ideology, and how we know what we know about the world. That story, as the title of my talk suggests, traces back to the rise of Fox News and conservative media. But as I show in Messengers of the Right, the modern conservative media establishment didn't begin in the 1990s with Fox News and talk radio. It was a mid 20th century innovation created to counter the objective journalism that many conservatives saw as liberalism masquerading as neutrality. So to understand the unmaking of the objectivity paradigm, we first have to look at its making. And that takes us back to the late 19th century. In 1896, Adolph Oakes bought the New York Times in order to differentiate the struggling newspaper from its more popular counterparts. He dedicated it to objective reporting. And while the word objectivity wouldn't come into common use until the 1920s, its hallmarks were present at the Times from the start of Oakes's tenure. American journalists who were invested in the ideal of objectivity claimed the trueness of their stories could best be evaluated by how well they adhered to the standards of accuracy, factuality, fairness, and less overtly, but no less importantly, their deference to official information and institutional authority. As journalism professionalized in the first half of the 20th century, those qualities of objectivity became central to newspaper and then later to radio and television reporting. So that's one set of standards that guided journalism in the 20th century. Conservative activists in the post-war era advanced a different understanding of media, one that attacked the legitimacy of objectivity and substituted for it ideology. Conservatives weren't the only ones who were challenging the idea of, object, of objective journalism, but their arguments about liberal media bias were the most successful and enduring of these challenges. Not only would conservative activists create a space for explicitly ideological media, but they would help change the meaning of objectivity. In time, objectivity would come to mean not just factuality and impartiality, but ideological balance that you would have a conservative and a liberal voice, each pronouncing their side. So today I'm going to trace that fight over how media communicate truth, how the meaning of objectivity changed over time, and then how false equivalency, the crisis of balanced journalism, paved the way for the concept of fake news and the contemporary crisis in political journalism. So let's actually go back to this moment at the turn of the 20th century when Oakes was first getting underway. Objectivity was not the only journalistic innovation of the period. In 
to change popular attitudes on the proper role of the federal state, a group of writers set about investigating and exposing the conditions of industrial America. Taking advantage of the world of cheap paper that emerged in the late 19th century, these progressive writers found wide audiences in the country's wealth of mass market magazines and newspapers. Thanks to Teddy Roosevelt, they became known as the Muckrakers, a name they embraced despite his less than flattering intentions. Both objective journalism and muckraking emerged in America media at a time when journalistic styles and values were in flux. Technological developments gave birth to low-cost newsprint in the 1880s and 1890s, opening the market for mass sales. Newspaper entrepreneurs made those sales through sensationalistic headlines, graphic images, and exaggerated, even invented, details. This yellow journalism peaked in the late 19th century, culminating in the frothing circulation battles between Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Where the Times molded itself in opposition to yellow journalism, muckrakers borrowed yellow journalism's tendency toward titillation and emotionalism, but added to it a sense of social responsibility and literary aspiration. So I think it's important to stop here for a moment and take a snapshot of this new media environment at the turn of the century. Yellow journalism playing, even preying on, emotionalism and low literacy. Muckrakers pushing for political change through poignant, sometimes less than accurate reporting. And the reporters at the Times focusing on fairness, accuracy, and on cultivating the voice of rational neutrality. Ours is far from the first era when competing journalistic values cluttered the media landscape. By the 1940s and 1950s, objectivity had won out as the chief value of professional journalism, which was itself a new field. It was at this moment, at the height of objective journalism's cultural power, that conservative media activists began to organize alternatives. Conservative activists saw themselves more in the tradition of the muckraker or the pamphleteer, advocates for truth. They didn't exactly reject objectivity. It was such an influential cultural force that it remained useful. But they did work to undermine established media's claims to objectivity. And they did this through the powerful new concept of liberal media bias. So a quick point before I dive into how this concept of liberal media bias developed. The charge could not exist absent the dominance of objectivity as a journalistic value. Until there was an expectation of objectivity, there couldn't be an argument that journalists were sneaking bias into their work. I mean, one could say, for instance, that the party papers of the 19th century were biased, but everyone would have said, so what? That's how they were supposed to be. Journalistic objectivity was always more a goal than a reality. Still, the pursuit of this goal shaped journalistic practices and norms for much of the 20th century. The objectivity standard defined mainstream reporting by the 1930s, reaching the height of its influence in the 1950s and the 1960s. The rise of objective journalism coincided with the rise of Daniel Bell's famed end of ideology. Just as impassioned political stances had been pushed aside in favor of the technocratic policies of the post-war era, so too had emotion and advocacy in journalism taken a backseat to what philosopher Thomas Nagel would later call the view from nowhere. Historically, this journalistic objectivity had a politics and it was the politics of liberal consensus. And since that is, for some, a bit of a provocative claim, let me hasten to add that this liberal consensus was a remarkably contentious consensus in both politics and media. Indeed, consensus, like objectivity, was more an argument about how American politics and culture should work than a description of how they did. Yet both were nonetheless powerful forces shaping mid-century politics and media. Conservative activists attacked this idea of journalistic objectivity outright 
the charge of liberal media bias disputed not just the content presented by mainstream journalists, but the very claims they made about their objective practices. We've grown so used to this claim of bias of supposedly objective media that it's hard to comprehend just how radical of an idea this was in the 1940s and 1950s. After all, this was an era when institutional neutrality was considered the special genius of the American system. In a world roiling with the terrors of fascism, totalitarianism, and communism, American liberals celebrated the technocratic state and its attendant institutions as spaces free from the passions and the pitfalls of ideology. To wit, two years after the publication of Bell's End of Ideology, President John Kennedy declared that the major domestic challenges of the era, as he put it, do not relate to the basic clashes of philosophy and ideology, but to the ways and means of reaching common goals. His belief in a national consensus, pursued through dispassionate management rather than ideological clashes, was a broadly shared faith. Shared, that is, by those who saw themselves as part of what Arthur Schlesinger called the vital center. Schlesinger, who wrote that 1962 speech by Kennedy, chastised those on both the left and the right who didn't hew to this agreed upon middle, who viewed New Deal domestic policies and liberal anti-communism as the only viable Cold War position. This consensus was, paradoxically, understood as both liberal and non-ideological. Such an understanding could only be sustained from within the vital center. Viewed from the progressive left or the conservative right, the neutrality of the vital center was a fraud. Activists on the left and right found themselves tarred as extremists, politically illegitimate in a post-ideology age. Because of that, they sought to expose the underlying ideological agenda of all of these supposedly neutral institutions. They attacked the press's claim of objectivity, the university's claim of neutrality, and the government's claim of technocracy. But it was conservatives who had the biggest impact, convincing not just the right, but a plurality of Americans that mainstream institutions were biased in favor of liberalism. So how did they do it? In their war on liberal media bias, conservative activists developed two main strategies. First, they created and promoted explicitly ideological, explicitly conservative media. In doing so, they provided their audiences with an alternative to objectivity as a way of understanding the world, a different network of authorities, a different conception of truth and accuracy, and a different set of values for evaluating truth claims. Second, media activists sought to expose the objectivity of mainstream media as a farce. Through statistical studies and media watchdog groups, conservatives worked to convince Americans that objectivity was a mask that mainstream media used to hide their own ideological agendas. So let's see how that worked in practice. Let's start with the founding of conservative media outlets in the 1940s and the 1950s. In particular, I want to call attention to the, idea about, the ideas about media embedded in these projects, the tensions running through them and the conflict that they create with people outside of conservative media. First, it's quite clear that conservative media activism was born in opposition to mainstream journalism and its claims of objectivity. In 1955, William F. Buckley Jr. founded the National Review, making clear from the start that he believed strongly in the ability of media to alter the political landscape. When he first proposed the magazine, he argued that it would forthrightly oppose the prevailing trend of public opinion, but more importantly that, as he put it, its purpose indeed is to change the nation's intellectual and political climate. Such a purpose contained an optimistic faith in the power of media to remake rather than just reflect public opinion. In the magazine's Statement of Intentions, Buckley further developed this view of American media and its effect on politics. In introducing National Review, he acknowledged that it would enter the world as a minority voice. Yet he ascribed the minority status of conservative politics to the willful practice of liberal media. He wrote, 
America's respectable press, has ordained that such voices as ours are of the past and aren't worth serious attention. But events in the very recent past positively establish that there is a widening gulf between the respectable press and the American people, that they look upon each other increasingly as strangers. Enter National Review, a pugnacious journal of conservative opinion that Buckley hoped might usurp mainstream media's role in shaping politics. Nor was National Review alone in uh, dedicating a substantial portion of its founding documents to attacking established media. A decade earlier, the founders of Human Events dedicated their Newsweekly to the reporting of facts that other newspapers overlook. And yet while touting this fact-based approach, the editors also promoted a distinct point of view. By the early 1960s, Human Events arrived at this articulation of its mission. In reporting the news, Human Events is objective. It aims for accurate representation of the facts. But it is not impartial. It looks at events through eyes that are biased in favor of limited constitutional government, local self-government, private enterprise, and individual freedom. And that's a remarkable statement, distinguishing between objectivity and impartiality. Human events editors created a space where bias was an appropriate journalistic value. The tension between those two ideas, between objectivity on one hand and ideology on the other, would become a defining feature of conservative media. On the one hand, the editors insisted that their work was objective. They understood the cultural and political power of objectivity, and they were unwilling to relinquish all claims to it. Yet they were also an ideological publication dedicated to the propagation of conservative ideas. That contradiction was resolved, to the extent that it was resolved, in two ways. Human events pledged to report in a factual way the stories and angles other media missed because of their liberal biases. In such stories, selection, not content, would be biased. But the editors also believed their ideological worldview was correct, and so believed they didn't have to sacrifice accuracy in order to be ideologically consistent. In other words, there was no contradiction to resolve. The conservative worldview was the objective worldview. The view of conservative media as a counterbalance to liberal bias won considerable support within the conservative movement where consumption of ideological media, consumption of conservative media, became a defining feature of the conservative identity. It's what you did as a conservative. But that view of conservative media created problems with those who didn't share that understanding of the media landscape especially when the people who didn't share that understanding of the media landscape ran the Federal Communications Commission. Such was the source of conservative opposition to the Fairness Doctrine and the cause of a number of contentious battles with the FCC in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So a little background on the Fairness Doctrine. The Fairness Doctrine was a regulatory requirement established in 1949. It required broadcasters to cover controversial issues of public importance and to present both sides of those controversial issues. But beyond that, there weren't really any clear guidelines. What counted as legitimate controversy? What counted as deviant and therefore unworthy of inclusion in balanced debate? There weren't any clearly defined answers. And this was a real problem for conservative broadcasters whose programs were by definition controversial. They had to handle a slew of fairness doctrine complaints in this environment of uncertainty and vagueness. And this fed their suspicion that the fairness doctrine was simply a nefarious instrument of government suppression applied only to conservatives. And the thing is, Conservative broadcasters weren't exactly wrong to be wary of the FCC. The commissioners did have a bone to pick with them. Conservative media activists repeatedly challenged the central assumptions the FCC made about journalism. The commissioners broadly accepted the journalistic assertion of objectivity. News reports, 
whether in print or on air, were assumed to be bias-free, unlike openly ideological programs. Conservatives saw no such distinction between news reports and conservative broadcasting. For the right, balance didn't mean giving liberals a chance to respond to conservative broadcasters. Conservative broadcasters were the response. So there was this core philosophical disagreement the FCC simply could not resolve, and that would remain the basis of conservative opposition to the Fairness Doctrine until it was abolished in 1987. But the reason I mention these clashes with the FCC is because they highlight how important it was for conservatives not only to build alternative media outlets, but also to dismantle public trust in the objectivity standards that the FCC and established media worked so hard to defend. So long as Americans could view a network anchor like Walter Cronkite as the most trusted man in America, rather than a mouthpiece of liberal propaganda, conservative media would remain a marginal presence. But that was about to change. On November 13th, 1969, Vice President Spiro Agnew traveled to Iowa to give a speech on television news and public opinion. The speech began as an attack on instant analysis, a relatively new practice where newscasters and experts responded to speeches immediately after they occurred. Nixon absolutely hated this. Um, but Agnew went after not just instant analysis, but the entire news industry. He argued that a democratic society could not function without an informed populace, a well-informed populace, not one misled by half-truths, obfuscation, and spin. Given that, Agnew questioned the wisdom of handing over so much influence to what he famously called a closed fraternity of privileged men elected by no one. In choosing the stories and writing the commentary, Agnew argued that these anchors, producers, and pundits served up not objective analysis, but the liberal pap of the New York Washington echo chamber. And every night, 40 million Americans tuned in, imbibing bias and mistaking it for neutrality. As you might imagine, Agnew's Iowa speech grabbed headlines. Suddenly, the question of media objectivity and liberal bias was part of a national conversation. Some folks in the media worried that it was the opening gambit in a crackdown on free speech. One CBS commentator fretted, my feeling is that the White House is out to get us. We're in for dangerous times. Others, though, co-signed Agnew's concerns. Within the journalism profession, objectivity was undergoing new scrutiny. Part of that scrutiny stemmed from the experience of white northern reporters covering the civil rights movement, many of whom found it increasingly difficult to represent the struggle for black freedom in neutral, morality-free terms. And another part of the objection stemmed from the Vietnam War, when objective journalists' reliance on official sources of information in both the government and the military led them to amplify, rather than expose, lies and misinformation about the war. And these experiences led journalists to engage in some pretty public soul searching. For instance, Tom Wicker, a reporter for the New York Times, used Agnew's speech to launch his own challenge to objectivity. Though he dismissed Agnew as a polyloquent pipsqueak, he agreed nonetheless that press values had become problematic. He said, if I had been in Mr. Agnew's place and had been trying to make an intelligent, useful criticism of the American press, I would have said that its biggest weakness, biggest weakness is its reliance on and its acceptance of official sources, precisely its objectivity in presenting the news. Wicker called instead for journalists to take up the task of journalistic muckraking to, as he put it, dedicate ourselves to the search for the meaning of things, and turn ourselves loose to be the true storytellers of our time, novelists of the age, rather than professional recorders of accumulated facts and authorized views. Wicker believed that journalism needed more heart, more courage, and more independence. That objective journalism, at least as commonly practiced, had failed. <laughs> 
so objectivity was under attack from all sides. But it was conservative activists who made the most of this biased charge. The heavy lifting fell to a woman named Edith Efron, a writer for TV Guide. In 1968, Efron set out to make a systematic study of liberal media bias by analyzing network campaign coverage. Armed with thousands of hours of videotape, she plucked out 100,000 words on Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey from each of the big three's nightly newscasts. Then she started counting until she had tallied up every favorable and unfavorable word spoken about the candidates. Crunching the numbers, she found that half of all words spoken about Humphrey were positive. For Nixon, a paltry 8.7%. No wonder she concluded network news followed what she called the elitist liberal left line in all controversies. The White House loved this book. They immediately understood the importance of a book that portrayed in hard numbers the extent to which the media were biased against the Nixon administration. After all, as John Chamberlain wrote in National Review, the book was science, not art. The charges of liberal bias were more than just Mrs. Efron say so. Her quantitative tabulation proved her point. Now, Efron's statistical work pretty shoddy. Uh, it, it didn't stand up well to criticism. But her turn to statistics showed that she understood the value of presenting evidence as scientific. It carried with it the authority of neutral objectivity. And that evidence appealed powerfully to the Nixon administration, which, through some mild dirty tricks, made the News Twisters, her book, a national bestseller. So statistics were a part of the right's effort to bring media bias to a broader audience. The development of media watchdog groups was another. Conservatives sought to police mainstream media outlets in order to both provide evidence of bias and also to kind of play the refs. In 1969, Reed Irvine founded Accuracy in Media for just this purpose. And that name is important, Accuracy in Media. It betrayed no conservative bent, reflecting instead a core value of objective journalism. As Irvine told conservative radio host Clarence Mannion in an on-air interview, we felt that since the journalists all profess devotion to, ac to accuracy, we would be able to work wonders by simply pointing out to them cases in which they were inaccurate. But soon, accuracy in media was filing fairness doctrine complaints against programs that they felt weren't inaccurate but were one-sided and biased. Accuracy in media was followed by groups like the Foundation for Objective News Reporting, established in 1975 by a group of conservative activists. Tom Winter of Human Events served as the chair. Conservative journalist Stan Evans and Human Events editor Alan Riskind sat on the board. And like Accuracy in Media, the Foundation for Objective News Reporting was a conservative organization that emphasized objectivity in reporting, acting as a guardian of fairness. Both organizations did so not because they believed that conservatives should be objective, but because they believed mainstream media, having proclaimed themselves to be objective, had to be held to that standard, or else be exposed for the liberal media conservatives were convinced they were. Though their work was conceived in opposition to the notion of objective journalism, conservative media activists discovered that objectivity remained a vital conceptual tool for undermining mainstream media. In the wake of Agnew's speech, conservatives sensed a climate change in American media. Clarence Mannion pointed to the 1971 launch of Spectrum, which was part of the CBS Morning News. The show trotted out commentators, many of them conservative, including people like Phyllis Schlafly, to offer news analysis. And it wasn't the only place that conservatives were popping up. That same year, 60 Minutes pitted conservative columnist James J. Kilpatrick against liberal Nicholas von Hoffman in a regular segment called Point Counterpoint. Kilpatrick mused that after Agnew's speech, a great sea change came over my friends in New York. And all of a sudden, they began to think, my gracious, there is another point of view in this country after all. And maybe it ought to be heard on our networks. In time, 
the conservative argument won. Not only did conservative media outlets grow in number and prestige, but conservatives claimed more of a place within traditional news outlets. In doing so, they didn't vanquish objectivity, but they did change its meaning. By the 1970s, objectivity would begin to mean not just accuracy and impartiality, but also a preference for ideological balance. This balance model, combined with the rise of entertainment news, spawned shows in the 1980s like Crossfire and the McLaughlin Group. These pugilistic left-right roundtables were the showier side of balance. But balanced journalism, on the one hand, on the other, had become a mainstay of reportage in the 1980s and 1990s, bolstered by the rise of partisan think tanks, a new pundit class, and the rise of cable news. Fox News Channel, which went live in 1996, interacted with this balance model in some intriguing and sometimes contradictory ways. The channel carried the tagline, fair and balanced, a phrase capacious enough to contain the ambiguities still unresolved in conservative media. On the one hand, it proclaimed a devotion to some of objectivity's central values, fairness, even handedness. We report, you decide as another Fox News slogan declared. And yet there was a second contradictory meaning behind fair and balanced. As an explicitly openly conservative network, Fox News balanced the liberal bias of established media. It was the counterpart to CBS News, ABC News, CNN. Like human events before it, Fox News thus carved out a space to be both objective and biased arguing it should be trusted because it was right and because it was right wing. Unlike human events though, which only published conservative voices, Fox News also reflected the dominance of balanced journalism in shows like Hannity and Combs. Hannity and Combs paired the network's conservative star with a less than effective liberal sparring partner. And that same model bringing on token liberals to battle the conservatives um, on Fox News continues till today on the network. Like objectivity as deference, objectivity as balance has met with mounting criticism. Over the past five to 10 years, critics have repeatedly pressed newspaper and television news shows over false equivalency, the both sides do it model of political analysis a model that has been strained by the unequal polarization of the two major parties. As the balance model came under pressure, journalists increasingly pivoted toward stressing not even handedness, but facts. This came about in part because of a mounting concern in established media about the growing power of conservative news, which didn't seem to adhere to the same set of journalistic values and also seemed to be as powerful, if not more so, than non-conservative media. Journalists, as well as progressive partisans, were frustrated with a media model where truth was tied more to ideology than factuality. And that frustration bubbled up across the political and cultural landscape in the first decade of the 21st century. I mean, consider these developments from the period between 2000 and 2010. In the mid-2000s, liberals began to self-describe as members of the reality-based community, a phrase they borrowed from Karl Rove. On the debut episode of the Colbert Report in 2005, Stephen Colbert coined the word truthiness. Satirizing a conservative cable host, Colbert praised truthiness, which he said wasn't something you thought with your head, but something you knew with your heart. The three major fact-checking organizations, factcheck.org, the fact checker and political fact, politic, politic fact were all founded between 2003 and 2007. And it was in 2010 when libertarian writer Julian Sanchez coined the term epistemic closure to describe the conservative media ecosystem. In an essay on the closing of the conservative mind, Sanchez defined epistemic closure as the construction of a full-blown alternative media ecosystem worryingly untethered from reality as the impetus to satisfy the demand for red meat 
overtakes any motivation to report accurately. His argument triggered considerable analysis of the conservative media's role in movement and party politics. And it even teased out some inadvertent examples of this epistemic closure. On Red State, a diarist demonstrated Sanchez's point in his denunciation of it, writing, I frankly don't know if every statistic in Goldwater's conscience of a conservative was correct or not. Nor do I know if every statistic or number in Reagan's A Time for Choosing speech in 1964 was correct. I don't care. I know the facts were in the ballpark, and more importantly, the principles were timeless and correct. It was an epistemological claim. Accuracy mattered, but ideology mattered more. I'm recounting this early 21st century history because I think it points to a shift in the objectivity paradigm that's been happening on our watch. As more and more people criticized balanced journalism for its false equivalency, facts rather than ideology moved to the fore. But while factuality is, of course, necessary for objectivity, and I think most of us would agree for good journalism, it's not sufficient. And that brings us to fake news. When the term first arose, it was meant to describe a very specific phenomenon, made up stories parading as news. These stories were hoaxes, mass produced money making schemes that took advantage of the clicks for cash model of internet advertising. This enters into the conversation because, as a recent Shorenstein report on fake news showed, conservatives were more susceptible to these stories, in part because of a tendency to trust ideological sources and also a distrust of fact checkers. Fake news wasn't a problem unique to conservatives. Plenty of liberals and leftists fell prey to fake news stories, but it was predominantly a right-wing phenomenon. And I point that out because I think that, for a while, Progressives and a few journalists conflated their concerns with epistemic closure with the rise of fake news. A list of fake news sites compiled by a professor and republished in several major outlets mixed together genuinely fake or satirical sites like The Onion or The, Hor the Borowitz Report um, or some of these ones created just for the election, mixed those together with partisan sites like Breitbart or The Blaze or Red State and that matters because it confirmed for many people on the right that fake news was just another way of not recovering respect for facts, but to attack conservative media. It's only been about six months since fake news became a focus, and already it's lost its descriptive utility, becoming a charge not unlike biased news, applied indiscriminately as a type of partisan signaling increasingly unusable as an analytical tool. But I think it's worth noting that the charge of fake news had so much immediate power, became hyper-polarizing so quickly, because the focus on facts had become so much more central to our conversation about real journalism. If facts are the field on which we play, then fake news is how you discredit that. And so where does that leave us? Well, the subtitle of this talk is The Unmaking of American News Media, which suggests we're in a pretty bleak place. But maybe the subtitle is a bit of a cheat, clickbait, if you will. After all, we still have news media. They haven't gone anywhere. But I do think, as happened in the 1960s and 1970s, and for that matter, in the 1890s and 1900s, political journalism in America is shuddering through a generational change, battered by powerful po partisan politics, shattered by technological shifts and economic decline. Political journalism cannot be what it was 10 or 20 years ago. It certainly cannot be what it was in the 1940s and 1950s, and not that it should be. We're in a period of turmoil when journalistic values and practices are being reassessed but they're not being reassessed in an insular way. When I'm on panels to discuss the state of news media today, they quickly broaden from the particular practices of journalistic organizations 
to a discussion of the broader crises and trust of civic institutions and the need for a generational effort in civic education. And I would add to these calls to address civic life and civic education one more. The need to move the conversation beyond facts and toward a focus on honesty, transparency, and accuracy. After 25 years of debate about postmodernism and the contingent nature of facts, it's been odd to see facts turned into a sacred object again. Yes, it's at least in part because they've been under attack, but I also think it's because it's easier. And this is a time that calls for us to do hard things. And make no mistake, remaking American news media will be hard work, but it has to be done because in a democracy, a journalism problem is a political problem. The two can't be delinked. The balance model, which is falling apart, functioned for an age when the dominant framework for politics was conservative versus liberal. But like the era of high objectivity in the 40s and 50s and 60s, the era of balanced journalism missed quite a lot. There were voices and people outside the paradigm of conservative and progressive who weren't being heard, who weren't being seen, whose needs and demands went unmet. As we've seen over the past five to 10 years and most recently in the past election, the conservative progressive paradigm is unwinding. Our new politics requires a new journalism, a better journalism. And that means not just looking at the last election, but at the last century of making and unmaking American news. Thank you. Thank you for a, a really great talk. That was fascinating. Um, I was wondering, so um, speaking to sort of your questions around objectivity, um, I remember back in the day when we studied history, we had to read E.H. Carr, and he says that most people believe that studying history is about collecting all the facts, and then there's sort of a soft cloud of interpretation around that. But actually, what historians have is a hardcore of interpretation surrounded by a loose cloud of facts um, that they've been driven to collect by the questions they ask based on what they believe about the world. Um, and so it seems like you referred to this. One way that journalists have tried to deal with this reality is by being more transparent about where they're coming from. Um, this is obviously harder at a place like the New York Times where you're not supposed to be coming from anywhere. Um, and the journalists who work there are not allowed to participate in political life in any way. I mean, they're allowed to vote, but <laughs> that's pretty much it. Right. Um, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the transparency model um, of sort of creating some, some attempt at objectivity, or, or maybe that's different than objectivity. And it also seems like kind of a fraught model to me, and maybe not the answer to a lot of this. So I'm curious what you think about that, especially as someone who works at, of course, an explicitly um, left of center publication. Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, anyone who's interested in this question of how to either do objectivity or transparency should read Jay Rosen's blog, Press Think, because he advocates quite strongly for transparency over this sort of voiceless objectivity. He presents, he, he suggests there are two models for doing journalism. You can present yourself as completely free of biases. And he argues that that's mostly a false position because no one can be completely free of biases. He suggests that the better way to do this is to be transparent about your politics. Lay out all your cards up front and then let the reader decide whether or not your reporting stands, whether the biases are, are slipping through. I mean, there is a problem with that, and that I think the problem is that there's a, a tendency to prejudge based on those biases. And this is what I mean by the, the model of, um, of evaluating truth claims that conservatives developed over 70 or 80 years. Now, you can argue that this is either an epistemology or just a set of epistemological strategies, but you know, this idea that you should tr 
the, that the trustworthiness of a source is determined by where they sit on the ideological spectrum. If that becomes the dominant mode of how we evaluate whether something is true or not, then transparency doesn't actually counter that. Um, so that, leave, that leaves us in a pretty fraught situation that I wish I had answers for, but I don't. Um, but I do recommend um, Rosin as a, as a press critic who's thought very deeply and interestingly on these issues. Thanks for the talk. Um, I had a question about, uh, I really like this distinction, or maybe like is a little strong. I was very interested <laughs> in this distinction between objectivity and impartiality. And I wondered, you know, I know, I think it's the New York Times that makes um, a distinction between voice and perspective. And mm -hmm. the New York Times reporters are supposed to have, are supposed to write in such a way that they have no perspective. And increasingly they are allowed mm -hmm. a certain amount of voice, meaning I gather that they have a kind of distinctive writing style, sort of a more magazine writing style, but they're not supposed to sort of take sides. But that the classic gray lady ideal is writing without voice or perspective so that it could come from you know, nowhere, that it's the right. institutional pronouncement of the New York Times and therefore is untainted by uh, an individual hand. It's sort of purified by its uh, having been processed by the institution itself. Um, how do you relate the understanding of objectivity to something like writerly voice or perspective more generally? Yeah, I mean, objectivity, I think that actually gets at a really interesting division. Um, the idea that you can develop voice that is still somehow also placeless seems artificial. It doesn't seem like something you can actually do because that voice has to come from somewhere. And whether it comes from a place of political perspective or not, um, people are going to, I think, be suspicious of voice for the very reasons that the objectivity paradigm that we're used to is one of voicelessness, right? That voice from nowhere where the, the author or the reporter just sort of fades into the background and then the facts and the information come to the fore. And even as I'm talking about that, you can feel the artificiality of it. What I like about that distinction between um, voice and perspective set up against the human events distinction between objectivity and impartiality is that it, it shows you the different models that they're coming from. Because what human events wants is it wants perspective, right? Um, objectivity is about accuracy, but it's not about not taking sides. Whereas the New York Times wants voice, but they don't want perspective. And now I feel like the, the scholars of pragmatism should come up and <laughs> explain why it's coming from a place of no perspective is artificial, it's impossible. Um, and so I think that the, the tension here is that your value system is built on something that is an artificial voice of authority. And I think that's why it's been coming under so much pressure lately is because people feel that artifice. Um, so again, no answers, but I do think that, that that distinction and where a place like Human Events versus the New York Times places the emphasis shows us the difference in their media strategies. Thanks for a fascinating talk. I was curious about the fairness doctrine mm -hmm. and how it originated. Uh, did it originate in a concern about the press or a concern about the public? Because all I think of that I know about media criticism, criticism uh, before then is Littman fearing the inf impact of propaganda. So is it a sense of uh, attempting to sort of protect the public from being manipulated. And then why did it go away? And is, is the fairness doctrine viable today as a solution? Yeah, tracing it to the, that's a great question. Tracing it to the origins um, of concerns over propaganda is exactly right. In 1940, the FCC put in place something called the Mayflower Doctrine, which banned any on-air editorializing. You could not give opinions on radio under the Mayflower Doctrine. And that's because here you are in the buildup to the US entry in World War II, and they didn't want people who had radio licenses given to them by the government propagandizing. They didn't want them giving their opinion on air. And by 1949, with, the, with World War II over, with the Cold War on the rise, it didn't feel like a sustainable position to never allow anyone to give any opinions on the air. So they wanted to come up with a model that would recognize the responsibility of broadcasters 
to not serve as propagandists. And that's what the Fairness Doctrine was about. It was about creating or acknowledging this, this obligation that they had to talk about controversial events. They couldn't just avoid all controversial events. They had to talk about them, and they had to talk about them fairly. And that sounds great, but they just didn't have any way of measuring that or weighing it out. And so the fairness doctrine remains relatively unused. There's only a few cases of fairness doctrine um, cases that come up in the FCC over the course of the doctrine's 40-year history. That didn't prevent it from becoming a conservative bogeyman because conservatives felt that it was being unequally applied to them. That radio stations, when they canceled or refused to sell airtime, would point to the fairness doctrine and say, well, we can't have propagandizers on the air. You're not being balanced. You can't just have conservative voices. Um, without getting into the long history of it, then some conservatives end up using the fairness doctrine, some don't. But there was enough conservative opposition to it that Ronald Reagan had made it part of his deregulatory platform in the 1980s. It ends up being repealed um, in 1987. A coalition of conservatives and liberals tried to bring it back several times until 1993. 1993 was the last real big push to reinstate the Fairness Doctrine. But in 1993, unlike all of the former years, the bill had a new name. It was called the Hush Rush Bill because by 1993, you'd had the advent of national talk radio, and Rush Limbaugh was seen as the, um, this powerful political figure. And so that was the first time that conservatives lined up as, as one against the Fairness Doctrine. Could it come back? I don't think so. And I actually don't think people would be all that comfortable with having a government body decide what's politically out of bounds on air. And the scarcity issue of radio airspace um, isn't the same issue in a digital age. Um, that was a good, great talk, thank you very much. I'm a deeply committed conservative, and so I have those biases. And what I notice primarily, or the way that I would understand media bias in the mainstream media, uh, is really what it chooses to cover and not cover, mostly actually not cover. Um, and one of the things I remember quite well during the Reagan years was that uh, factories were closing pretty much all the time <laughs> on pretty much every nightly news show all through the Reagan years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sort of tailed off a little bit in, in George H.W. Bush, and then the factories seems never to have closed during the Clinton <laughs> administration. Early in the Bush administration, factories closed again a little bit, uh, but then they stopped closing, interestingly. Uh, similarly, there was great problems of homeless during the Reagan administration, which disappeared under Clinton and became much greater, you know, suddenly homelessness was back under Bush. Uh, so, and it strikes me that these, this is not true, uh, that in fact these problems were pretty much consistent over time. Uh, and what, one thing that I'm interested in is the factories closing. That, that went away uh, in the news, although we know now that the China shock of entrance into the WTO uh, made things much worse for factories in America than even under the 1980s uh, Reagan situation. Uh, and this was missed by the media. Now that the deplorables rose up and struck, put Trump into the White House, um, we have the New York Times scrambling to get reporters out into the great Midwest to discover what, what they missed because they missed uh, the story of people who were rather angry about what was happening in a very, very fundamental way in the society, and they just didn't report on it. Uh, so I'm sort of curious about how that fits into your really quite excellent talk. Thank you. Um, well, I do think that this is, that that's one of the places where the core of the media bias argument, why it had so much power, because you could point to examples like that. Now, <clears throat> I will say that this is the, the challenge or the weakness of the balance model of um, focusing on all these issues in conservative liberal terms because there are a lot of other stories that the New York Times missed, stories about African American communities, um, stories about immigrant communities that also didn't get covered. So I, I do want to emphasize that when we're talking about media bias, we think about it in liberal progressive terms, but I think that, that there are other stories that get missed as well. But I think this is the power of the media bias argument is that that's true, it's, it's, the, it's the cloud of facts surrounding one's understanding of the world. 
Um, and I think that that's, that's the case. I mean, if, if you look at the drive now to reinvigorate investigative journalism, I would think that as a conservative, it would be like, hey, where was all the investigative journalism during the last eight years? And while I think it was there, the way that it was presented was different. Um, so I think that there is a legitimate claim to be made that um, we know that most reporters aren't conservative. Um, and so story selection probably does um, reflect some bias. The answer, the question is whether the answer to that bias is to discard objectivity altogether and um, to seek out only ideological sources. Well, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. I wanted to um, ask you about the influence uh, or the um, uh, example that was perhaps set by communism in generating uh, the idea of uh, liberal media bias and in generating a conservative backlash. So for example, uh, Walter Duranty's work at the New York Times, which at the, um, at the, in the day was considered objective, but now of course is recognized as having been basically propaganda for Stalin. Uh, that's one uh, example of something that conservatives at the time complained about. They were generally kind of shunned, and now they're you know, vindicated. They were correct about that. Uh, if you look at not only the product, not only uh, what gets into the papers, but also what goes on in the editorial rooms, what goes on in staffing decisions, et cetera, um, there was certainly a, a pattern of bias uh, you know, going back uh, into uh, you know, the 1930s and onwards. Um, so for example, uh, Whitaker Chambers talks about this. He talks about uh, he had been at Time Magazine. He faced uh, certain uh, difficulties uh, as he drifted away from communism. Uh, similarly, I think uh, Rolf de Toledano, who had been at Newsweek, um, you know, saw biases within the uh, editorial chain of command there. And we, you've talked, uh, I think, uh, quite eloquently about uh, some of the uh, conservative complaints about that then become kind of attacks upon uh, a certain form of objectivity. But it seems to me that it was important that objectivity was always vulnerable to many kinds of attacks from different directions. So um, objectivity, for example, was vulnerable to a certain infiltration strategy, which is what communists uh, explicitly set out to do. Um, so they wanted to maintain the authority of objectivity, but they, did, they, they had bad faith, basically. And in here, I think we see one of the vulnerabilities, perhaps, of open societies in general, and of liberalism not as a, uh, an ideology, not as a political uh, disposition, but simply as an approach to life, objectivity being a kind of uh, this neutrality, right? Uh, that people who are determined not to be neutral can be very effective at subverting that and, in fact, weaponizing it uh, against uh, their opponents. So it seems to me that a lot of um, what we've seen uh, from conservatives has been triggered by, you know, sort of earlier um, programs pursued by, for example, actual aggressive communists. Yeah, I think that's a great comment, and you've um, ex expounded on it probably better than I can. Um, I, I do think things like the Alger Hiss case, um, or the way that conservatives perceived the writing about um, Joe McCarthy in the early 1950s, or the, the, let's take it back even further, I trace the origins of modern conservative media to the period right before World War II, when people who opposed US intervention in the war felt that they were entirely shut out, not only of the political parties, but were blacked out of the media as well. There were several journalists who lost their jobs. Um, so again, there's a, there's a core complaint, there's a core weakness that I, we've seen most more recently, right? That, that um, open media standards can be manipulated. Um, so I agree with all that. I, I would just, again, add that that what it evolves into um, in terms of things like trying to, to trying to balance this all out, right? Trying to correct the flaws of, of um, bias is hiring more conservative writers, um, trying to bring more voices online in a way that I think leaves a, um, leaves like a, 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 a blind spot to the other voices that aren't being heard as well. And I think about this when I think about the New York Times recently hiring Brett Stevens um, when the New York Times only has like two women columnists and one columnist of color, um, that if we only think about bias in terms of liberalism and conservatism, there's a lot that we're missing in terms of voices that aren't being reflected in the news. Hi, let me ask what I think is a relatively simple question compared to some of the other ones. Uh, you ended your talk uh, uh, saying that what we need moving forward is a new model of journalism, which sounds hopeful, but it's kind of open-ended. In your opinion right now, what do you think are some of the best leading lights suggesting what you think this new model could look like? Uh, you see, you said that was an easy question, and then it was a hard one. <laughs> No, I mean, good journalism is being done. One of the things that um, 
I will I'll log roll for an organization that I write for. One of, the, I like the rise of explainer journalism. I think it's been incredibly useful for filling some of the, the holes in media in the sense that nowadays one of the problems of media pulling it out of the bias conversation is that stories evolve so fast it's really difficult for readers to keep up with the basic facts of, of what it is they're reading about. So having something that explains, that puts into a broader context, um, the stories that people read is really important, and that's something that we do over at Vox, um, which, I found, which I found really useful. I mean, there's really good investigative journalism and really good writing happening at the papers of record in the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and the New York Times um, that is also accompanied by some flawed writing in those venues as well. Um, so I don't have a particular model that is extant right now. I think that most news organizations are struggling with these questions and haven't yet figured out exactly how to resolve them. Um, so I think we're in this moment of flux, and if I can think of better examples for you later, I will, I will share them. <laughs> All right, thank you.